Agnero Agnero here, originally from Ivory Coast, where the speaker is from too, and uh, a son of the Ma now, proud son of the Ma. Thank you for being here for the third edition of Africa Day, and uh, this year we thought that you know enough of Zoom. Enough of, you know, we need to uh, uh, feel that we're still humans. And then we can't talk about uh, Pan Africanism like virtually. So we decided to bring uh, a friend of mine. We grew up in the same country, a beacon of uh, capitalism and, uh, and uh, uh, um, pro West. Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire was like. Uh, the stronghold of uh, the block of African countries devoted to imperialism. Whoop. Whoop. And, uh, but Cote d'Ivoire has also been a, a beacon of education. We went to uh, uh, a school system that was one of the best in, uh, in Africa. 60% of uh, the gross income of the country was devoted to educating us. That's why here you see the product of this. But uh, at some point, yeah, me and, <laughs> and, and, and the speaker. So, uh, but also uh, Cote d'Ivoire in the 90s had enough of uh, IMF, World Bank, and the structural adjustment that was destroying, you know, the social fabric of this country. We were part of a, a revolution of students who said enough is enough. And then from there, um, the multipartism came back to Ivory Coast and democracy started. So I want to uh, pay a tribute to all our friends, even my brother who's coming from Montreal tomorrow for the second you know, discussion will, which will take place at the Fletcher Library. They went in exile because, you know, it wasn't very good to stay in Ivory Coast and, and, and face, you know, you know, the oppressive regime over there. But today, uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a larger, you know, view on the continent. And for that, I would like to introduce Dr. Nyaka Lagoke, professor of history. He will introduce himself, but I wanted to say that he's a pure product of Ivory Coast. He was educated here also in the US, and then uh, he's here. So welcome, Dr. Nyakana Goke. You're going to hear about W. P. T. Boys, and you'll hear about Harry Sylvester William. Yes, they played a great role in the history of Africa and the world, but somehow, that series of, of, the, of the series of the Pan-African gatherings uh, is uh, somehow overlooked. And then as I was doing research, I discovered some names. Uh, Homer, Jack, George, Loft, uh, Henry, like a, a singular trick, all those names. And then when I came here, when Eric was telling me uh, that uh, 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 Robin's father uh, created the newspaper a uh, years ago. A uh, years ago, no, the sound. A uh, years ago, and then I did not know uh, what he was talking about until this morning, as I was talking to her and I was talking to Greg. I discovered that some of the information that I was looking for uh, was in towards freedom. So for me. Even if none of you are shown up today, I have already found what I was looking for in Burlington. But I'm glad that you guys are here. So thank you, Greg, and thank you, Robin. Thank you for the wonderful work. Now, I'm going to try and take the mantle of a professor of Pan-Africanism, but at the same time, as a student of Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism is composed of two particles, pan, and Africanism, pan, which means all, Africanism, which is what related to Africa. The word Pan-Africanism was coined around 1900, but many people say in 1900, during the first Pan-African conference organized 
in, by the by the Trinidadian and Henry Sylvester William in London. The idea of Pan Africanism is about unity, solidarity of people of African descent or of people of Africa uh, who had in common uh, the living experience uh, of suffering uh, because of a system, because of several systems of oppression back then, slavery, uh, Jim Crow law, segregation, and this is how the people of African descent in the Americas have decided to come together because at the same time in Africa, Africa was under colonialism. But one thing that I learned, I learned that I discovered that I'm going to share with you is that there is a way to talk about Pan-Africanism and that's why if I wanted to talk about Pan-Africanism, I always want people to talk to see what I call the schematic of Pan-Africanism or the anatomy of Pan-Africanism. I'm not going to be long on this. The first thing that we have to have in mind is about four, four categories of phenomena, four. The first one is a series of system of oppression, slavery, colonialism, Jim Crow, segregation, and then apartheid. The, uh, and then of course you understand, uh, people under the system felt the need to come together in order to resist the oppression. The second category of phenomena is a series of, of theories, uh, of, of the recent risk, risk theories, white supremacy, social Darwinism, uh, the white man burden, I would think that is uh, uh, ordained by the divine to bring civilization across the globe and to colonize non-white people. The third category of phenomena uh, is what I call the rise of nationalism. Uh, uh, let me talk first about it is a series of revolutions. The first one is the American Revolution. Sometimes when people talk about Pan-African, they don't see how you guys here, your ancestors, have inspired or impacted other people. Uh, even though the American Revolution did not uh, suppress slavery, but America uh, gave to the world the principle of unity in the organization of people when most of the European nations were under monarchy, democracy, and the principle of unity. That revolution was going to inspire the French Revolution of 1789. And then the French Revolution was going to inspire the Haitian Revolution uh, we started as a struggle in, in 1791 and that ended in 1804. Black people slaves here in the Western Hemisphere, organized, emboldened, and inspired by the American Revolution and the French Revolution, and they fought and they gained their freedom. Of course, I can talk about the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, the Europeans decided to go to different parts of the world, not just in Africa. No. And then they decided to uh, use and exploit the resources of the people and exploit them in order uh, to sustain the industrial age uh, in, in, like in Europe. But the Industrial Revolution gave rise to other ideologies. One is feminism, another one is what? The rise of nationalism. And when the Austro-Hungarian Empire was put together in 1867, and then when we saw that uh, people were organizing according to what they call, call what they call common nationalism, we saw the rise of pan-Germanism, the unity of the Germans. We saw pan-Slavism, the unity of the part of the Slavic-speaking people under the leadership of what Serbia which, by the way, was going to lead to World War I. It was in that context when the Italian also claimed the right to the not to be united. It was in that environment that the people of African descent came with concepts like 
pan Negroism, words coined by WP Du Bois, and it was in that context that Henry Sylvester William uh, coined the word pan Africanism. So, four categories of phenomena series of system of oppression, series of theories of racist theories, and then uh, uh, a series. Uh, of, uh, of nationalism, and then, of course, a series of revolutions. Now, we move to three movements that predated Pan-Africanism. Those three are, one that I've already mentioned, Pan-Negroism, uh, and the second one was going to be the Back to Africa movement. It is place or in the Western Hemisphere where black people thought that, you know, if it was hell for them to live here, some tried to think about going back to Africa, the land of the ancestors, the motherland or the fatherland. The movement was not too successful, but uh, some did try to go, supported by a white abolitionist and supported by a white colonialist and supported by black leaders. And this is how Liberia was going to be created as an American invention, and this is how Sierra Leone was going to be created by the British. So we have uh, the Back to Africa movement, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and then we have pan that I just spoke about, and we have another movement called Ethiopianism. There was a time that the word Ethiopia was used as a generic term to identify all black people of Africa. And later on, it was going to be claimed by spiritual leaders in the United States or in the Americas, and it was going to be a movement about black-driven, black-led independent churches. And then that movement was going to have three ports of entry in Africa, Cape Colony, created by, like, in 1652, which was going to be the foundation of white supremacy in South Africa, Liberia and Sierra Leone. And then when Ethiopia defeated the Italians in 1887 at the Battle of Tongali, and 1896 at the Battle of Artois, the Ethiopian movement was going to become so strong that for black people all over the world, Ethiopia symbolized the dignity of black people. Ethiopia, by the way, was going to be the only country not to be colonized. When Meredith II, the leader under uh, whom it, it, Italy was defeated in 1896, he drafted a, uh, the flag, the colors of Ethiopia. So if you go, you can check online. Three major colors green, yellow, and red. When Kwame Nkrumah, oh yeah, so when Kwame Nkrumah became the leader of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, who was an advocate of Ethiopianism, Kwame Nkrumah decided uh, to borrow the Ethiopian, uh, the Ethiopian kingdom's colors. This is how, when you go to, if you check online, Pan-African flags, you can have one of the colors that, that uh, Mark is going to use, but you will see yellow, green, and red. Togo, Mali, Ghana, you will see everywhere people have what similar colors in the spirit of Pan-Africanism. Now, I'm going to talk about the evolution of the Pan-African movement, 1900. 1900, Pan-African, uh, the word was coined at the conference of, uh, in London in 1900. But I'm going to tell you now, friends, let's see what, what is going to happen. One leader comes, he gives a particular name to his gathering, contributes somehow to the evolution of the movement. Henry Sylvester William with the naming of the movement. W.B. Du Bois organized the five major Pan-African congresses, 1919. And then 1921, 1923, 1927, 1945, like in Manchester, was going to be the one who, who theorized the movement. Marcus Garvey from Jamaica, one of the greatest figures during the Harlem Renaissance, 
was going to be the one who transformed Pan-Africanism into a mass movement uh, during the Jim Crow era, when he was organizing his conventions in Harlem, thousands of black people gathered to support him, and he was the greatest advocate of the Back to Africa movement in the 20th century. Kwame Nkrumah from Ghana, who was at the Manchester Congress in 1945, who has aided a gentleman from Trinidad called George Padmore, Kwame Nkrumah became the leader of Ghana, and thanks to his rise to power, the Pan-African movement now was going to reach the level of the state. When Africans could not agree on how to deal with the Cold War and how to resolve the Congo crisis, as people were claiming different uh, 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 allegiances, uh, some were supporting the West, some were supporting the, the Soviet Union in that context, uh, there were several groups, the group of Casablanca, the group of Brazzaville, the group of Monrovia, and then I used to see organized a meeting in Addis Ababa, and then they met and they came together, and then they created the Organization of the African Unity, which is what the first major continental body. Pan Africanist now was going to reach the level of the continent. Malcolm X who was the member of the Nation of Islam. After he left that movement, created the fruit of Islam. And then when he went to Africa, visited many countries in Africa, and I even saw the report in Toward Freedom, when Malcolm X came back, he created an organization called the Organization of the, of the Afro-American Unity, in order to emulate the Organization of the African Unity. This is how Pan-Africanism as a movement was going to touch the level of the diaspora uh, through the structure Malcolm X put together. I think in the, in the year 2000, the Af Organization of African Unity was transformed into the African Union and they recognized uh, the diaspora as the sixth region of the African Union. The five major, the first, five first, Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, Central Africa, Western Africa, and Northern Africa. So this is uh, the basic things that I wanted to share with you about the Pan-African movement. And now, uh, one very important thing that I want to talk about now is about the deconstruction of Pan-Africanism. Uh, when I meet, I'm not saying that because I'm here, I'm sitting in front of many white people. I'm saying this everywhere I go. I said the same thing in Togo. In the beginning, Pan-Africanism was about black nationalism. It is true. When Blyden, an advocate of Ethiopianism, an advocate of the Pact to Africa movement in the 19th century, was the first to coin the word African personality, which, by the way, was going to inspire uh, Leon Contrata Mas, uh, and this is uh, and then Leopold Sedes ago uh, to articulate a cultural movement called Negritude in the 30s in, uh, like, in, like in, in Europe. While here in America, people were dealing with the Harlem Renaissance. But when Kwame Nkrumah uh, launched the series of the All African People's Conferences, supported by George Pagba from Trinidad and supported by Ras Makonen, the first one took place in, in December 1958. But before the conference of December, there was a conference in April 1958 when I think eight African independent countries met in Ghana in April, from April 15 to April the 22nd. During that conference, the major issue was the war of independence in Algeria. And during that conference, Kwame Nkrumah said, the Sahara Desert no longer divides us. And then, when he, when he defined or proposed the African personality, he was thinking about a multi-racial definition of the African personality. You can be black, you can be an Arab, you can be from India, or you can be an Arab, you 
as long as you claim Africa as your home, and then you don't claim any other place uh, 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 as your home, and then you believe in the law of the majority, you are an African. So since 1958, African personality has a multiracial dimension. Since 1958, Pan-Africanism has a multiracial definition. And this was reinforced during the conference of the All African People's Party. Uh, the, okay, the conference, the All African People's Conference in 1958. There were some white people. Patrick Duncan from South Africa with his wife from the Liberal Party. Michael Scott was a white person and many other people. Your father was not there, but certainly his newspaper uh, uh, wrote a, uh, published a report written by Homer Jack. So, so this is what we need to know when we are talking about Pan-Africanism. As I want to talk about the ideological divide uh, during, uh, in the era of the African independence. Some wanted communism, socialism, some wanted capitalism. But all of them knew that they need, they need to, to, to draw on the African cultural value system. But somehow, uh, the Cold War was too strong, and then we could not see the rise of the articulation of a true indigenous value system around which uh, to build uh, the development of Africa. Julius Nyerere from Tanzania, I uh, was going to be one who tried, uh, and he came with the concept of Ujama, that, it, it, that he called African socialism, and by saying African socialism, he reduced uh, the purity of you know, the African conceptualization in terms of finding concepts in order to build Africa. Kwame Nkrumah believed in socialism, later on he built an uh, uh, articulated conscientism, and then this is the, what the debate was about the ideology. Why I'm saying that? When Nelson Mandela was going to, after he spent 27 years in prison, when he became the first black president of South Africa, South Africa brought to the, brought, uh, gave to the world uh, an African endogenous value system called the Ubuntu philosophy which is about humanness, which is about African collectivism, which is about the African family. In other words, uh, we don't have uh, to go to the east or to the west in order to find a theory around which articulate the destiny of Africa. And I, as I'm, as I'm articulating the new dispensation of Pan-Africanism, I advocate, defend, promote Ubuntu. In Africa, we have 2,000 languages. And out of those 2,000 languages, there are six, between 600 and 900 Bantu or Bantuic languages. Ubuntu is the philosophy of the Bantu people. One human being is called Muntu. More than one is Bantu. The way the Bantu people interact with each other is called Ubuntu. And then uh, you can have that concept in many languages in Africa. Uh, Ubuntu in South Africa, Ubuntu in Shona and Zimbabwe, Abantu in Uganda, Pomoto uh, in Lingala, Burkindi uh, in Burkina Faso, Nmamdu uh, in, uh, with the Ipo in Nigeria, Mpuntu uh, in, 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 in Akan language in Ghana. And this is what we are articulating. Now, let's talk about what is happening today. As I talk about what is happening today, I go back to the Berlin Conference of 1884, 1885, when Africa was partitioned like in different European spheres of influence. When uh, colonialism was defeated, it was replaced by another system called neocolonialism that Kwame Nkrumah called uh, collective colonialism. And today, Africa is under neocolonialism. From east to west, from, from south to, to, to the northern part of Africa, the Europeans put together 
several institutions tomorrow when I present my book, I will show you what I call the wheel of imperialism and how it functions. But today, just know, when you take the media, you will see Voice of America, BBC, CNN. Uh, you talk about international trade, the World Trade Organization. You talk about the military bases. You have what NATO, the French bases. Uh, you talk about uh, international affairs. You have the UN, with what the reality theory, according to which might is right. So you have that all those institutions created by the European that they control. And then when you talk about trade, same thing. And then you can see the power of those multinationals. Just to give you an example, a rare vice a French company, they were exploiting uh, uh, uranium. uranium in, in Niger. And then there was a crisis, and a rare said, you know what? We don't want to fight with this anymore. Now we are willing to, to give you 12% of the uranium that is under your soil. The question is, what was the percentage that was given to the state before that agreement? Same thing is happening in my country, Ivory Coast. Water, electricity, the third bridge, uh, uh, the banking system, everything that is important about the economic and social life of my country is controlled by the French. And they call us independent. The currency that we use, created in 1945 by the gold, is still in force. The bills are printed in France, and the currency is a French, a French construct. Just to give you an idea, you go to Nigeria, you go to Ghana, the same system. And now today, there is a reawakening of the African people. You may have heard about a series of coup d'etat, but we call that a series of revolutions. Mali, the Central African Republic, Burkina Faso, even Ivory Coast, my country, where a former president was taken to the head and he spent almost eight years there for them to find out that he was not guilty. No. But at the same time, his life has been destroyed. He went back 77, old, tired, with multiple sicknesses, but he's there. And then this is what is happening today in Africa. Today in Africa, we see a new scramble for a new scramble for Africa. Uh, we see uh, that uh, with the war in Ukraine, the Europeans, led by the United States, uh, thought that they were going to mobilize the entire universe against Russia. And it is not happening. Why? That is the question people should ask themselves. Why the United States cannot mobilize the entire world uh, to condemn or to condemn or to punish Russia? The history of Africa is that when colonialism was in force, when our ancestors were fighting to become free, there were some countries that supported the decolonization process in Africa. Russia was one of them. Cuba was one of them. China was one of them. And then when you go online, if you see Cuba, an African Odyssey, that documentary talks about how Cuba, the Cubans bled, died on the battlefield of Angola for Angola to be free. And then the struggle of Cuba in Africa led uh, to the decolonization of the Portuguese colonies, to the independence of Southwest Africa and Namibia, to the freedom of Nelson Mandela, and to the dismantling of the apartheid system. You will see that in that documentary. If you were lucky to find uh, Visions of Freedom, a book written by Piero Glebeses, and I think he teaches at Georgetown American uh, University, great professor. He wrote books on the Cuban involvement in the decolonization of Africa. 
So, uh, Russia may be an, auto an autocratic country. Putin may be uh, the evil of the 21st century. But those who want to see a new international order, those who want to see freedom, they think that Russia seems to be offering an alternative uh, uh, compared, uh, uh, compared to what the Europeans are doing. So I am just sharing some information. If you do not agree, we can debate. I can give you more details. So this is what is happening today in Africa. That's why even the leaders that we do not praise in Africa, they decided to embrace non-alignment, like their predecessors in the 50s or in the 60s. And this is uh, what we need to know. And that's why I will think that uh, uh, the Europeans, they should adjust, they should understand the cry, the suffering, the pains of those who were oppressed by the systems of oppression and who still are suffering today are from the oppressive existence of the, the, the what we can call the global governance or what I call the wheel of imperialism. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I am willing to respond. Thank you. Uh, for such a rich history of the um, Pan-African movement throughout the many decades, and uh, as he mentioned, my, my father was involved with this from 1952 onward, and, he, and it was called the Non-Aligned Movement. So my question is, now, what, um, how can the Non-Aligned Movement, the Pan-African Movement, be involved uh, in maybe bringing peace to uh, Ukraine or to some of the struggles? I mean, poor Somalia is, is destroyed now by uh, you know, forces that are outside by proxy, what I would call proxy forces. And I wish the Pan-African movement could strengthen itself to, uh, to lay out the future path that needs to be taken. Maybe some other questions. Some other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Been amazing to me talking to you. Yeah. You have to come here. I'll, I'll fix that. Can I just try? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the things that's been amazing talking to you and others from Africa is the fact that there does seem to be a new world order emerging, and that seems to be really around the war in Ukraine. Uh, and I become aware of that talking to this man and Eric Agnero and others who seem to be p pointing out that the developing world is really moving into an alliance with Russia and China over the war with Ukraine. Americans don't like to think about that because we are supportive of Ukraine. And regardless of whether we are supportive of the war in Ukraine or not, I think if you read <laughs> The facts on the ground, the developing world is moving in the direction of China and Russia. And I want to ask if that's a fair analysis and why that might be and what is the United States going to do about it? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, give it some answer. I'm going to try. Okay, so uh, this is what we do. Uh, uh, Wherever I go, I see white people, and many of them know that uh, I do things without hatred. And then I love to give facts, and then I love to challenge myself. So even though uh, the presentation I gave today, I gave like a shorter version in Togo, but when Greg gave me Towards Freedom, like all those articles, you won't believe I was just reading, 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 because I always like to find facts because when you meet brilliant people, you need to be sure of your facts. So it is unfortunate uh, that uh, many people are dying in Ukraine. And then I deplore the war. 
I don't want to see any human being being killed or oppressed. It happened to me uh, one day I was talking about the war in Ukraine. I was so reported uh, that, uh, what's that? <laughs> yes, being plugged in, plugged out. Hello? Voila. Now the microphone can go all the way to Essex Junction. Hello? Hello. That's what's wrong. Hello? Hello. Thank you very much. So, um, well, this is one thing I'd, uh, I'd, sh I'd like to share with Americans. I understand. I've been teaching, I've been here for uh, 20 years. I taught in elementary school. I taught in uh, high school. And uh, I taught at the college level. I went to school, I uh, went to Howard University, and I taught at Montgomery College. So I have been around a variety of people in America. White people, black people, Africans, and then why I'm saying that? I understand that Americans want to remain the most important country in the world. I understand that. <laughs> And it is a legitimate uh, like a desire. Who does not want to be the greatest? Who does not want to be the, you know, the, uh, the strongest? But listen to this. Maybe this, today there are things I'm going to say. Maybe you are hearing that for the first time. But there are different ways you know, to achieve greatness. America did not become the greatest nation during World War II because they dropped two atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. No. By the way, when they dropped those two bombs, uh, I don't know if you know that, they were the only two bombs that they had at that time. But because they were the only ones, everyone knew that the power was the United States of America. But guess what? Four years after America dropped those two bombs, Russia, they discovered, they not, Russia created their own bomb. And that's why people spoke about the nuclear race, because no one wants to go to do a war with nuclear bombs. In other words, even if America put 800 military bases in the world, because this is the understanding of the American leadership, you know, to control the world, even if Yes, they think that this is the, the best way to do it. My argument is that America is not what it is because of the 800 military bases. When I was growing up, who has not watched the American movies? Who does not know the names of those American actors? Or Elvis Presley. Who does not know? <laughs> even myself, even though I'm not a big fan of music. I remember being a child watching those movies of Elvis Presley. So America, who does not know of the, you know, the, the sweetness of Coca-Cola? So all those things I'm saying that, just to say that China is becoming a power, not because of the 800 military bases, uh, not because uh, China dropped some nuclear bombs on someone, but China found a different way of rising to power. One of the strategies that the Chinese use is population growth. One billion, four hundred million people. If there is a war between the United States of America and China, and if they wanted to use those nuclear bombs, there will be some survivors likely in China, then in the United States where the population is what? 340 million people. Quite a horrible argument. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for people to listen to the fact that there is, you cannot resolve everything what? With violence. So now, 
John Mersheimer, that is his name. Great professor wrote maybe more than 10 books. Jeffrey Sachs, those two people that I've just mentioned, they're not black like me, they're Americans. Since 2015, uh, Mersheimer has been saying that Ukraine was going to be what? Wrecked by the United States, by, by Russia, uh, because what the West is doing is going to lead to a war. If you never found that document, that argument is online. Now, even though we understand American exceptionalism, but why what was applied to the Cuban crisis cannot be applied to the Ukrainian crisis? That is my argument. If uh, America and the West understood that we, could, we can preserve the lives of people, the same can be applied and then Russia can fall maybe uh, in 10 years and then whatever thing they want to do to show that they have the greatest nation, they could do that. So that is my answer. The next thing now is what? When the war erupted, because of the history of Africa, one billion people, the history of China, one billion, four hundred million people, the history of India, one billion and four hundred people. When you put those one billion, one billion, one billion all together, it's going to be what? Three billion, five hundred million people out of eight billion people. Those three spaces that I just mentioned, experience in the case of Africa, slavery, and in the case of India, colonialism, in the case of China, colonialism and the scramble for China. The, histor the historical memory is pushing the, the citizens of those countries or those regions to say, you know what, maybe we need to have a new world order and that's why the leaders of Africa, the leaders of China, even though they deplore the war in Ukraine, they think that uh, maybe instead of doing a war, there should, it should be an opportunity for discussion. So now, uh, so, so now in the case of Africa, people think that uh, maybe uh, it is an opportunity for people to change the, 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 the international order. The British countries uh, is receiving application in order to counter the Britain rules institutions. Uh, we saw that Mexico uh, is trying to be closer to some other countries like China or Russia. Uh, we saw that uh, uh, China, Russia, India, Brazil, they're uh, trading in their respective countries and people are talking about the deep dollarization of the world. These are things that are happening. So what I'm, I'm sharing with you, I'm living here in America. I want America to offer the opportunities it has been offered to the world, but it can be done differently. And this is what my argument in this. And the Pan-Africanists think that we need to organize as people in order to propose an alternative or a new force. Thank you. Well, uh, no, there Goma. was uh, this gentleman even before you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. Oh. Great, right up here. Exactly. Okay. Well, sorry, I will speak in French because it is easier for me. And so. Uh, hello. Hello. Well, I will speak in French so you understand it. I can translate it. Votre exposé était vraiment magnifique. Vous avez fait l'histoire du panafricanisme tel que beaucoup de gens comme moi ne le savaient pas. Hein? Je vous remercie beaucoup. Your uh, exposé was brilliant. Uh, you did uh, very well and so much that you know you uh, taught me things that I didn't even know as even an African. Okay. Alors, je vais vous poser une question capitale pour nous les Africains. Hein? Euh, cette question, vous l'avez bien deviné, c'est par rapport au franc CFA. C'est cette question-là que je vais vous poser. Parce que c'est très bien de nous parler de, de panafricanisme, alors que la plupart des Africains qui sont dans ces pays où le franc CFA règne à maître, ne font rien pour changer ça. 
Hein? Parce que pour nous, nous estimons que les, euh, la monnaie fait partie euh, de la souveraineté d'un pays, de tous ces pays africains là-bas. Quelle est votre idée sur le franc CFA Faut-il les supprimer ou bien vous avez une autre alternative Merci. Ok, so uh, quickly, uh, what do you think about uh, the CFA, which is the currency that France, you know, uh, has imposed to more than 14 countries in Africa. We're talking about Pan-Africanism, but still we are linked to that currency. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, China's uh, strategy in Africa, particularly the, what I understand is the Belt Project. So, um, what impact is it having in Africa, particularly on um, this uh, scramble for Africa? And effective, and how do you think it will play out? All right, sorry, gentlemen, this will be the last question because our <laughs> you can come tomorrow to the other um, uh, gathering. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I am going to start with the CFA franc. Uh, the CFA franc uh, is uh, a source of uh, debate in Africa, uh, particularly since 2017. Uh, there was a group of Africans uh, that launched a anti CFA franc uh, campaign. And I know uh, you guys have been patient. So I did not want to give too many details. No, no, only, yeah, yeah, yeah. only two minutes. Sir. No, no, no. So I, so I am against, uh, actually I think that Africans should have their own currency. It's not even about if they are, <laughs> if they are capable of managing uh, the currency. Uh, it's just like a common sense. If you say that you are free, you should be in charge of your currency. Okay. Now, the leaders in power, this is one thing I say everywhere I go. It is not easy, it is not easy uh, to go and say, you know what, we do not want to be a part of the CFA Frank campaign, the CFA Frank zone. Because the system has been established since 1945, and many leaders who went against that system were either uh, killed, like the first president of Togo, Silva Luis Olympio, uh, it's a long story, I don't want to take time to talk about it, or some other leaders. So, we, what we do, is what we're doing. We are raising the awareness, we are denouncing. Some people are more uh, active on that campaign. And then many African leaders, who've been, even those who are close to the French, they seem to understand that something needs to be done. Okay. So this is what is happening today in Africa. Merci. Merci. Now, uh, great question, great question. Again, like I said, you know, we can talk about this uh, like we say in my country, uh, until tomorrow. But you know, I did not want to do that. Even though Africans used to do that, they can be under the power for hours. And uh, when Americans are saying time is money, for them they don't know, the, you know, they, they just talk, talk, talk for hours. So I did not want us to do that. So uh, I have spoken about America, and that's why I like your question. Uh, the, what um, China is doing, and everyone knows that China wants to be the most important country of the world. That is a fact. Now, how they doing that? They building some Confucian centers, Confucian centers in Africa, uh, in order to promote the soft power. And then China uh, decided somehow that when or while the Europeans are still in that neo-colonial mindset, uh, they seem to show that they don't want to be involved in enforcing a particular world view in many countries in the world, second thing. The third thing that the Chinese are doing, it is that the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And again, listen to this, I wrote that somewhere, but I saw, uh, I always forgot the name, Ursula, the lady from the European Union. Uh, yeah, Ursula von yeah, der Sonnen. Yeah, I think I know the, just the first name. So that lady, last week, she said that the West need to propose an alternative
to the China to the Chinese Belt uh, 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 and Road Initiative. That's right. She's right. Yeah, but that's right. Yeah. So this is what she said. She's right. So what is that? But how do you? Do it that? is a number of projects, construction of ports, seaports, construction of bridges. A uh, construction of highways and construction of several other things uh, as uh, the uh, reincarnation of the Silk Road that the Chinese controlled 100 years ago. In the case of Africa, as I was doing some research, I discovered that from Ethiopia to Djibouti. There is a road, long, there is the 700 or 760 kilometers to link Djibouti to Ethiopia. You don't have an infrastructure. When people wanted to do trade, uh, it will take 10 days for people to reach Djibouti from Ethiopia. Wow. The Chinese. Put uh, a highway, a, a train to link those two countries, 700 and some kilometers. That's right. The train thing that people used to do in 10 days, no, in seven days, they are doing the trading in 10 hours. Mm. Who is not going to be sensitive to such a, a, a developmental uh, infrastructure if the United States of America, the greatest nation on the face of Earth, if America decides uh, to withhold the billions of dollars that they're pouring in the Ukrainian crisis, uh, first of all, to build more shelters in the United States, and then to give uh, food and education to the, 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 uh, up to the to Americans, or if they could mobilize some funds uh, instead of using those funds for people to be killed, or because they think that that is the opportunity to destroy Russia, or if America decides. Uh, to find its own model of development. Listen, friends, we can live in a better world. That is my argument. And that is the argument of Ursula from the European Union. And that is the argument of a think tank. It's online. I forgot the names of the people who put that together. They said exactly the same thing. So this is what the Chinese are doing, of course. Uh, the Chinese that we are seeing today of Xi, Xi, Xi Jinping, uh, is the, they are different from the Chinese uh, that we know under Mao Zedong. Even though, even though Mao uh, was believed to have killed many people, somehow we did not recognize that China has been involved in the new liberal worldview the way China is doing today. Why I'm saying that? It, the, the development model is not based on the Satyagraha of uh, Gandhi. It is not based on the concept of me, of the Russians. And it is not based on the Confucian ethics. And it is not based on the Ubuntu philosophy that I was talking about. It is based on a model of what? Exploitation too. And then we, as Pan-Africanists, as we are articulating a new disposition of Pan-Africanism, if I were to meet the Chinese, or if I were to meet the Russians, listen, you know you have not colonized us, but you can do better than that. That would be my position. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the opportunity uh, to not speak to you. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you very much. Like Inyaka said, we could be here till tomorrow. I have, a, I have a, just something to say. If America gives us in Africa the means to make a, a choice, not I've been like working for the U.S. government. I was a Voice of America. I know I've been even called by some people 
I thought that I was even an agent because I know I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a baby of the US government. But we have to understand that people over there have changed. The new generation doesn't want to be seen as our fathers were seen like colonial beings. I was working for the US government. The US have put billions of dollars, in, you know, in what? Condoms. During the AIDS pandemic. Only condoms. That's right. Billions of dollars. We don't want condoms. We want to do business. There are African Americans that are from Africa here, like me, like Nyaka, like Jacob, leaders that could be economic ambassadors of the US. Go there as China does. You know how China do? China gives money to its own citizens to go conquer Africa. Why not give it to Af Americans? Why not give it to African Americans who will be welcome in Ghana, in Togo, in Liberia? Militarism is not the answer. Nobody can, you know, blow Africa because you have nukes here, blah, blah, blah. It's diplomacy. Thank you very much. The following, <laughs> the following act would be music, and then we can eat, or shall we eat before music? Let's do it at the same time. Why not at the same time? Start, you know, getting your plates, and then we gather for music from Madagascar. Madagascar. I wish you went to Madagascar. It's a beautiful place. Beautiful island that drift away from the continent. Oh, and then we have a, 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 a son of this country. But food is open, the bar is open, and then in 15 minutes or 20 minutes, we come for this act of uh, our friend from Madagascar, Mikael. Thank you very much. Merci Mikael. So, so he's quite uh, remarkable, isn't it? Going, Eric. <laughs> this is my family. This is my, my life and my little boys around. Hi, everybody. This is Mika Haley. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. We are thank you for all of us. Sharing some music. Uh, I know you're gonna listen. But I play world music on a guitar and Valia, Valia, one of the instrument, the musician playing in Madagascar during the ceremony, spiritual, the Malagasy believe. I'm so glad to be here to share with you about that because we are human living with our spirit. That's the difference between the animals. And they are so sweet because they came before us. Yeah, Don't, nobody can complain about that. Yeah, but the rhythm, the rhythm is our heart to give the beat the same beating we start counting zero and this song it's called Rieka. Rieka means ocean wave uh, ocean wave because the people before to talk to their ancestor or the creator they have to go to the meet the wave first because the wave is one of the strongest. If the wave is gonna do his uh, craziness, we really gonna be know about that. So this song it's called Ocean Wave because all the benediction is all the cleanest from the ocean wave.
night, everybody. I hope you're feeling good. And again, this is Mika Healy. Originally come from Madagascar, playing world music on the Valia and guitar. And so happy to be here, share some music with you.
All right. How's everybody doing? Cheese for both. Cheese for both. Cheese for Always so so happy to be here because I'm gonna tell you a little stories. Uh, the first time I came to United States and then the, my second year and then I came to Vermont and then I met Esli. Esli is right there and then she translated me at the hospital. I was being really sick at the hospital and then no one can speak my language is here. But, and then I uh, still have a hard time to uh, speak the English language, but <laughs> she came and she introduced herself herself to me, and then I was really happy to meet her. And then, okay, we stopped that day. And then another day, and then I have a show around in Vermont, and then I heard someone says, "Cheers, Bobo," and then. Who is that guy? And then that guy is fucking Malagasy language. And then that was Eric. He's right there. And then I'm here now. Yeah. 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 He's the cheese for What is that? N nothing much. <laughs> Always good. Everything is good. Okay. Don't think a lot of things. Everybody, cheese for Yeah. yeah. Cheese yeah, this for voice a good thing, and it's a very good language. It's a very good sentence in Malagasy. This for that means you are well, right? We are all well. That's why we are meeting each other here today, and that I'm so happy to be here with you because this is the time we share each other, right? We have to think about the what is the future, Be, because why? All is we are human, right? We are human because what is the first problem? The first problem is the climate change. If our environment is gonna be bad, we are all gonna lose our life. That's it. So. That's our goal, how to protect our Earth. That's the really important for everybody. That's Michaeli's message. Let's protect our Earth. Because if we lose our Earth, nobody can see anything anymore. Yeah, let's protect our Earth. Let's give a love, lots of love to our Earth. Because our Earth is give us a food, give us our opportunities, because uh, give us a chance to live, to live to this beautiful Earth. And we are all together to fight with that. And then, why? Because we can see that we start to lose small, small, small our life now. What is for our next generation? If you don't protect that. So if you don't protect that, that means we, are, we love just ourselves. But love other life. So that's Michaelis to be here today to share with you. Let's give a hope to our health.
Asami kurang Thank you, thank you. Sorry about that.